is Alpha Kappa. We're hosting a very successful convention in hospitality. Everything's been organized, been a few conventions. Probably one of the most well organized brothers we pick up from the airport. Let's give Alpha Kappa a round of applause for all the work. And of course, our national council, who, you know, behind the scenes, uh, a lot of people do forget that these are non paid positions. These people volunteer their time to do them. We might not always agree with you know, how things are run or we think it could be run better. We have to remember these people have professional lives as well. And, you know, they take the time to throw conventions and give us the guidance when we need. So run applause to everybody who takes their time to be a national conference. <laughs> and with that said, I think Churchill did a really wonderful job of uh, introducing me, but I am Kevin Natulin. I am from Detroit. I founded Alpha Beta on April 18, 2010, spring 2010. Um, all my Alpha Beta love, show me some love here. Where's my Alpha Beta guys? Woo! Oh. So, and we'll go from there. <laughs> what a, uh... Oh, there's a keyboard here. Okay. Yeah, but where's the, there's no next button. Just click it. Oh, okay, perfect. So yeah, these are my contact information. I passed out a piece of paper to everybody as well, because obviously you're not going to stay in the stream. So whatever you use, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, I'm on everything. If you want to stay in touch, ever have future questions, want to connect with me, whatever social media you do use, you can find me. That is my personal cell phone number. If you do ever want to talk to me or call me for any reason, always open. The guys know I always respond to phone calls and texts. On the bottom, you guys will find questions and comments. I did want to not make this a lecture. I do want to make this more interactive. And I want you guys to actually tell me what's going on in your respective chapters and schools so we can actually have a productive discussion. Because the next points I give you guys are not going to make sense unless you guys are interactive and tell me where it's coming from your side so we can you know, come to the middle here and see what we can do to improve our fraternity. Okay, key points. We're going to be talking about community political engagement, about leadership and influencing people, and how to build your brand. So as Churchill famously just completely butchered the name. <laughs> I am running for precinct delegate. And a lot of people have been asking, even Chicago showed me that I've been uh, wearing the t-shirt. People have been kind of asking me, what is that? We're not really familiar. You know, because a lot of people don't realize how many steps there are. You know, people just see president on CNN, and then they're like, oh, he made it to president. But there's so many steps in between. And I would like to uh, tell you guys how this works. So what is a precinct? The precinct is the smallest political unit in a country that all voters in a precinct vote at a location. So when you go to vote, your precinct, it determines how many populations, usually about a thousand people is your precinct where you go to vote. So a precinct delegate represents that precinct nationally, so it is your neighborhood. And you discuss the issues that are more important to them, because you know your neighbors better than any governor, or president, or senator can do, right? Because you know your neighbors, you know what issues, your neighbors are your friends, they're people you've grown up with, played ball with, they know you very well, right? So you can reach out to the political parties, whether it's Republican Party or Democrat Party, and express what is going on in your neighborhood, so those local leaders can make laws or regulations that affect your community. So what exactly do you do? You help people get registered to vote, take information on issues and candidates to the voters in your precinct, identify others interested in your party and recruit new party members, help turn out your party's vote in your neighborhood on election day, keep your party leaders informed about the issues that concern voters. Pretty much what I've just said, and I'm actually running for this position on August 2nd. So I'll be running on the same ballot that the governor and the senator and the Congress will be running, right? I need about 400 votes to win. That's what I'm saying, right? So I've been campaigning, going door to door, explaining to people, there's six people running, Three people can be one, so it's 50-50, right, on, on who's going to be one. Do you guys have any questions about how, how that works or want to know anything on that? This is kind of like the very fast part because I know most people don't really care. So I'm going to zoom in through, but just want to answer the questions people had about when they saw me yesterday. Well, let me ask you this. How many people are registered to vote? I'm Canadian. <laughs> are you registered to vote in Canada? No. Oh, there we go. <laughs> how many people will be voting in November? It's a very good, decent amount. It's a very good, decent amount of people. So how do precinct get elected? They're gonna get, in Michigan it's August 2nd, and the Democrat and Republicans have the same thing here. And from there, <coughs> um, I'm gonna express later what I wanna kinda of do. So leadership and influencing people. The secret of success, right? People always ask, how do you become successful? People spend a lot of money on books, on videos, on classes to become, how do I become successful? What is success, right? Success is very relative. Is it $1 billion? Is it helping your neighbor when they're in need of your help? What is success? Is it graduating in four years? 
with the degree you wanted. Everyone has a different definition of success, right? To some person, LeBron James could be really successful, and to other people, you know, a local priest could be very successful who doesn't have nowhere near the fame or the money, right? That's why I really want to stress the success, right? And what is relevant in our community. Speak of no, speak no ill of no one, and speak all the good I know of everyone. Any fool can criticize, condemn, and complain, and most fools do. But it takes character and self-control to be understanding and forgiving. Benjamin Franklin said that when he was appointed to become ambassador to France, our first ambassador, right? And a lot of people ask and they say, stuff in our colony is not going too well, or in our fraternity, or in the political world. What is it? What's going on? The communication seems to be lacking. Well, I always ask the question, how are you communicating? What is going on? Are you always criticizing? Are you always condemning people? Do people not feel open to come to you? We've all felt in the room, right? Have you ever been scared to come to a leader or a professor or a teacher or your parents? And you wanted advice, but you didn't know how to approach it because you thought they were criticizing you for doing something wrong? Has everyone had that experience in the room, right? Yeah. And I think that's what kind of, we need to break those barriers. I think in our fraternity, especially in our respective colonies, we have people who go through the fraternity, they become president, vice president, treasurer, whatever, but the new guys don't feel that connect right away. They feel if they make a mistake, or if they try to plan something, or if they try to do a bake sale, or if they try to do something, instead of someone reaching out to them saying, hey, good job, it didn't work out as well, we didn't raise as much money as we wanted to, but you still took the initiative to do that. And I think that's what's really important, is building that connection and that trust from the beginning, so people have the initiative to start going out there and getting more things done, instead of always feeling like they're gonna be criticized. One of my favorite examples from the many books I read, so Bob Hoover was a famous test pilot and a frequent performer at air shows. When he was returning to his home in Los Angeles from an air show, 300 feet in the air, both engines suddenly stopped. Right? By some miracle, he managed to land the plane, but the plane was badly damaged, although nobody was hurt. So that's a good thing, right? This happened in 1928. You have to remember, you know, ruining a plane in 1928 cost a lot of money. There was, it was really hard to build them at that. So when Hoover first landed the, the emergency uh, pilot, he wanted to inspect the airplane's fuel because he thought that's the problem what happened with it, right? And as he suspected, he was right, the World War II propeller plane had been flying, but it was fueled with jet fuel instead of gasoline. And that was the problem, right? And the person in charge of that was a mechanic who did, who'd made that mistake. So that mechanic, by making a simple mistake, putting jet fuel instead of gasoline, could have potentially caused three deaths. By making a silly mistake, obviously it wasn't intentional. So the question remains, how did Bob Hoover handle the situation? Upon returning to the airport, he asked to see the mechanic who had serviced his plane. The young man was scared and had tears coming down his face. He had just caused a loss of a very expensive plane and could have caused the life of three lives as well. Normal reaction, right? The person realizes that someone could have just died, ruined the plane, very sad reaction. But instead of yelling and scolding at the kid, Hoover put his arm around the kid and said, to show you, I'm sure she'll never do this again, you're servicing my F-51 tomorrow, right? So instead of criticizing that person, or instead of saying, you're an idiot, what are you doing? He gave that person more responsibility to learn from his mistakes, right? He showed that person that you can, you can learn and you can achieve something by making not the same mistake again, right? So it's forgiveness. It's being forgiving. It's learning from your mistakes. It's being able to communicate without criticizing, right? And like I've said, that's, that's very important when we go um, further. So principle one, by the way, this is set up into principles that I established in my life that helped me become really successful. I mean, you guys can have your own principles. These are something that I've done and have helped me become where I am today. I never criticize, I don't condemn, and I don't complain. I never criticize people, I don't condemn, and I don't complain ever. Life is life and you're put into the situation that you are. You know, some of us are born to affluent families, some of us are born to hardworking families, some of us have to work and go to school, some of us can enjoy other benefits, but that's life, right? Everyone's given certain circumstances and you make the most of them, right? Whatever those circumstances are. So things that people want, I know in Psychology 101 you all heard of Sigma Freud, and he has his needs for food, and thirst, and love, and desire. So things that people all want, health, preservation of life, food, sleep, money, and the things that money will buy, life in the hereafter, sexual gratification, the well-being of our children, parents, and siblings, and a feeling of importance. Is there someone in this room who doesn't want any of those things? Does everybody want those things? <coughs> I'll quickly ask if anybody wants to answer. On that list, what do you think is the most important? 
Or maybe the three. Alright, <laughs> <laughs> guys, this is the interactive part. So don't all fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> what do we think, guys? What are the top three here? Bread, food. Food? food. Okay, food. Anything else? Food's important. Money. Okay. Important. <laughs> well, you kind of need money to get food usually. So that's a feeling of importance. Feeling of importance. Okay. So. Well, at least no one's playing Pokemon Go that I can see, so that's a, that's a strong start. So appreciation. Lincoln once began a ladder by saying, everybody likes a compliment, right? I try every single day to a stranger or to my friends, anybody that I talk to, at least give one compliment per day, right? It brings positive energy into my life. Instead of always staying negative and not being happy with the way things are going, you find the good things in other people and you bring them out to them, right? And that makes that person stand out, right? Because when you give them a compliment, they're much more likely to have a better day and then help somebody else out, right? It's kind of like moving it forward. And like William J said, the deepest principle in human nature is the craving to be appreciated. I think most of us who do things <coughs> want to feel some kind of appreciation for it, right? That's, that's why we do them, for the most part, right? We feel like if we throw a surprise birthday party for our friends or we get a mom a Mother's Day gift, it's the feeling of love and appreciation you get in return is what kind of makes you do that, most of the time, hopefully. And that's the biggest desire from what I see, the difference between humans, mankind, and animals, is that feeling of appreciation. It's feeling the difference that, in going to our fraternities and to our colonies, that appreciation, right? Do we really appreciate the brother who does a lot of work? The brother who wakes up earlier in the day and decides to find sponsors for JDRF, as we heard earlier, for Sugar Free Bowl, or finds sources for our fundraising, or does the little things that no one notices, do we really do our best to appreciate that brother? Sometimes. Sometimes, right? But not all the time. And I think the question is, what can we do a better job to make that brother not discouraged? How many times can someone do something and then say, hey, this is just not worth it anymore, no one really cares? And then you lose that one person that was really, truly committed. Has that ever happened in your organization, do you feel like? Yeah. 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 You've seen that happen? So that's something that we can definitely work on as well. Principle two, give honest and sincere appreciation, right? I think that that's really huge, right? It's not just being like, hey, have a good day or it was nice seeing you today, but something that's honest and something that's sincere, right? Especially since we're all brothers in this room, right? And especially with your local line brothers or the brothers in your respective chapters, they're looking for that, right? That's the reason they crossed. They wanted to have that brotherhood, that unity to have someone say, hey, you've been off a couple weeks. Is there something wrong? I've noticed. You know, do you want to get some coffee? Do you want to get some lunch and talk about it? Or, hey, you know, we want to get you more involved. It seems we can use you in this, right? It's that sincere appreciation and giving them the gratitude when they deserve that after. So getting people to get things done. That's why I've heard countless amount of times, no one cares, no one wants to do anything. Let's just move on. And I can't get any of my brothers, especially from presidents and vice presidents of local chapters that talk to me, have said, I just cannot get my general body to do anything. They just don't care. They don't want to. Whatever the case is. I found a really great example that a professor once told me. Um, there's this guy named Casey Dutchman, a telephone engineer, a student of the course, actually, and he couldn't get his three-year-old daughter to eat breakfast. The usual scolding, pleading, coaxing methods had ended with no success. So the parents asked themselves, how can we make her do, how can we make her do it, you know? Unless you take the spoon and you force feed her, obviously, you know, what other solutions are there? Does anyone want to take a guess on how they did it? Incentives. Incentives is close, yeah. Good job, Karn, most active brother here. <laughs> so the little girl loves to imitate her mother. So to feel big and grown up, one morning they put a chair and let her make the breakfast food. And just at the psychological moment, the father dripped into the kitchen while she was stirring the cereal and she said, oh look daddy, I'm making the cereal this morning, right? And why was that? Because that girl has seen her mom cook breakfast, right? And she imitated her mom's actions, right? So when other people see you doing the right thing, it's natural to be like, hey, I'm doing the right thing here, right? That's just, that's just the way life works, right? But when we're doing other things, you know, bad things or anything, I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about a lot of issues here today that um, some people don't wanna talk about, but that's fine. And we're going to um, 
address that. So that's very important, imitating good behavior and building conditioning that helps people get that accomplished. Arouse in the other person an eager that they want, right? What interests me might not interest you, right? As my job as a leader in the community, or if I'm running an organization, or if I'm running something, you have to find what interests the brothers, right? I'm very interested in politics. That's my personal thing, I love it, right? I like what it does, I like being community engaged. Not everyone does, and that's fine, right? Some people like drawing, some people like playing music, listening to music, whatever the case might be, right? And we have to find that interest in our respective communities to find what it is, right, as a brothers. So maybe when you initiate a new class, or when you start a new um, program, do a survey, ask brothers, especially new ones that you haven't got a chance to know what drives you, what motivates you, what interests you. So then instead of just doing this regular sugar-free bowl every single year, maybe, maybe your chapter personally likes basketball more, or like they said they like tennis more, whatever the case might be, but if you're planning an event that you like more, you're way more likely to participate in that, right? Everyone's had that class in college that's not been a gen ed, it's been just a, you know, a little elective, but you really enjoyed that class, right? Because you got to choose that class and take it, and you learned a lot from it because you actually care about the subject matter, right? That's kind of go right here. It's really big to find that in other people and what, um, well, being generally interested in other people, right? I didn't want to give you guys countless examples, by the way, because I'd be here for an hour, and I don't think anyone wants to hear me that speak that long. So, become generally interested in um, other people, in other people's interests, right? It's not just saying, hey, how was your day? How are you doing? Goodbye. Moving on with normal conversation. It's becoming actually genuinely interested in your friends, in your in your peers, in your coworkers, in your that's what that's what I do, right? I kind of find out what it is that people like that are relatively close, and I can't find out for the entire world. But then when it's that person's birthday or a special occasion, I know what gift to get them, right? So instead of going and getting them a $25 gift card somewhere, I actually get them something that they like. And when they open it, they're like, oh hey, like this person actually took the time to know like this is what I like. And that matters something to them, right? They're way more likely to follow up with a phone call. They're way more likely to get involved and engaged, right? So being interested in other people is, is huge. Smile. I think these people lose this a lot of times, right? In normal conversation, is we, or even walking outside. How many times do we just smile at a stranger, right? Just to say, hi, you know, or, or it was good. It's just something very, very small. It costs no money, it costs really no effort, except moving your cheeks each way, right? And it's just a simple smile, but it goes a very, very far away with someone. Principle six, be a good listener. Encourage others to talk about themselves, right? We all have that friend who always comes to you with problems, right, and wants to talk, but then when you need that friend, he's somehow never there, right? We all, we all have that. So that's being a good listener, right? It's listening to people and expressing yourself, but also hearing what they have to say, right? One of my favorite things that uh, someone once told me is there's a reason that we have two ears and, and one mouth. Right? We're supposed to listen more than we speak. That's the only way, because you already know what you know, but the only way you can learn more information is by opening your ears and listening up, right? But unfortunately, some people, you know, do the other, and they, and they talk, but they don't get any new information. That's why what's happening today, as you're gonna see, is a lot of people are so polarized, is because they have their perceptions and they have their opinions, and they're not really willing to listen to anybody or any new information, right? They kind of listen to their same source of information, whether it's the news or anything else, and that's what they do. Seven, talk in terms of the other person's interests. That's what I kind of talked about, find out what the people's interests are, and then talk about them, engage them in that. Make the other person feel important and, and do it sincerely, right? Find, find that person that means something to you and do something with it. Talk to him sincerely. Tell him, hey, like something that we're gonna talk about a lot is from what I've heard from brothers all over the country um, that I talk to and you know hire people. In this fraternity, we have a lot of brothers who drink or smoke or maybe take illegal drugs in this fraternity, right? And other brothers are concerned about that, right? And But they don't know how to approach that situation. They don't know what to say, right? They don't know, should we just let it be? It's their life, but it, it, it is what it is. Or should we sit down and talk to them, right? I feel this isn't just, you know, a Northeast or a Midwest. Or, I feel brothers from all over the um, country have told me that now this is becoming a problem. I, I don't know about other fraternities, I don't know about other sororities, I don't talk to them, but within ours, this is a problem amongst our, amongst our brothers, right? So what is it? I mean, we can't ban drinking, we can't ban, I mean, if you're gonna find anything, you're gonna find it, right? So what do we do as a collective among our brothers to fix that situation, right? That's what we have to decide, right? Do we do anything about it, or do we just let it keep going? But we also have to remember, 
responsibility, right? If you're gonna go out drinking, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you committed to a service event in the morning the next day, you gotta be there. It's as simple as that, right? You made a commitment to be there at 8 a.m. and talk about being responsible. I mean, everyone's over 18 in the fraternity, right? Everyone's a grown person going to college, making their own life decisions. It's very simple. No one's gonna be no one's parent, no one's gonna be anything. But if you don't stay committed, do you think that when you have an event or you have something planned, those same people will give you the respect? No, that's how it works both ways, right? So we do really have to remember that when it comes to being on field expensive. Building a brand, right? This is what I'm really about, is building um, your brand as a human being, right? So it's standing for something you believe in, right? This is number one, right? You have to fight for what you believe in it is, right? Regardless of what it is, right? Whether, whether you think that police officers are, you know, assaulting people's rights, whether you think that a new law needs to get passed, whether you think a new law needs to get repealed, you have to fight for something you truly believe in, because no one else will, right? The strongest people that we study in history now are the people who stood up for something. The Rosa Parks did not give up her seat. Martin Luther King walked from Alabama to Washington, D.C., right? Because they believed in that. It wasn't easy work, right? The whole world was against them at that point when they did that. But they stood for something they truly believed in. It's a lot easier to fight for something you're passionate about, right? It's a lot easier to rally for causes that, you, that inspire you, right? It's a lot easier to be in a charity organization, for example, when the brothers were talking about earlier, they knew that person that passed away, right? And how passionate GRF was to them, right? So it's a lot easier to continue that because they have a personal relationship with the brother and the family now, right? So it's not like a task to them, it's something that they're really passionate about and they get it done, right? They come here, they flew from Texas, you know, and they gave us a presentation about it. That's something they truly care about. You have to find that passion at a very early age. The people who find those kind of passions, right? Whether it is LeBron James in basketball, or whether it's someone who loves computers and creates an app or anything like that, the earlier you find that passion, the more time you have to work on it, and the more time you have to succeed in it. That's what I find very imperative. I know that a lot of people come from backgrounds where their parents kind of say, you have to follow a certain career path, you have to do a certain thing, that's kind of expected, but you gotta be innovative. You have to believe in innovation. You have to believe, that's fine following that career path, there's nothing wrong with that. But there's also that strong desire to try something new, to be creative, to do something that no one else has, right? Someone uniquely created Facebook that we all used to, or Twitter, or Snapchat, or any of those apps, right? They weren't thinking like everybody else, right? Because no one else before that didn't that, right? Again, nothing wrong with being going to become a doctor, or a lawyer, or an engineer, or any other career path that's, you know, you go through school, you get a job, and you move on, but thinking of innovation, thinking of ways to create new things is what's gonna help you take you to the next level. Again, if you wanna get to that next level, some people are perfectly comfortable with a normal lifestyle of being, having a normal nine to five job. That's something you guys are gonna to have to think about for yourselves. Don't be afraid of failure. Right. So many people have tried and tell me they don't do something new because they're really scared of failing it. They think it's a waste of time. They think there's no point in doing it. They think, hey, I can do something I'm really good at and then just you know, don't have to worry about any of the new things. That's a very flawed way of thinking. That's what creates the most problems, um, whether it's in our personal colonies and fraternities or chapters, or whether it's in the real world. Trying new things, right? It's going to that restaurant that you've never been to. It's traveling to a country that you never heard of. It's going with a friend to a vacation that you might have thought you never did a road trip. It's trying new things that will, I did a tour yesterday with some of the NC guys of Chicago. I've been here multiple times. Maybe, I don't know, probably over 10 times since Alpha Capital has crossed here. Never done the tour, right? Been here, seen the city, did the whole thing. I learned so much new information about why the skyscrapers were there, when they were built, how they were built, who built them. Of course, I didn't remember all the information, nor did I need to, it was an exam. But I learned so much information about it that I can come back and know why Chicago is now important in the Midwest. What, how it started, the creation of it, right? It's because I opened up my mind and I wanted to learn new information. That's very key. Fighting the status quo. There's always gonna be someone, and I'll tell you in political world, right? People tell me every day, Kevin, you're too young. You're too inexperienced. It's simply not your turn. You have to wait in line, right? There's people who've been working way before you, and unfortunately, the way it works in politics is you wait your turn, right? I refuse to accept that. Unfortunately, I've had to break a few relationships or connections with people because of that. I refuse to believe that because of my age, my ideas don't matter as much. 
or I shouldn't be listened to, or I have to tell someone else my ideas and they can represent me, right? I truly don't believe that. I believe that what today, in my opinion, and going a little bit into politics, the young boys, the under 30, our voice is not heard. They don't know about the issues that concern us, right? No one's really talking about student debt. They tell us they are. No one's talking about the issues that affect our society, right? That affect us. And that reason is because no one wants to listen to young people. They think, you know, why is there certain age requirements to run for something, right? And then that's what I've told, but I fight that every single day. You know, people have told me when I'm running for this precinct delegate, which is not a big deal, by the way. I mean, it's, it's cool, but it's not like I'm taking over the country here. You know, I'm being honest. And people have told me now, even today, you know, you can't run, you can't do this, you can't do that. But I fought the status quo, you know, and I will run, and hopefully I win in August 2nd. I'll keep you guys all updated with that. But I do want to make a difference. I do want to represent people of my own age and the issues that matter. Some people will give you excuses. They'll tell you, you missed the deadline, right? Or they'll tell you, hey, you know, you didn't apply in a proper time, right? But I'll tell you this, guys, the only deadline ever set in life is the one God sent you. And that's when your life comes to an end. That's the only deadline ever you have to worry about in life. No other deadline. You have time to accomplish anything you truly want to. The question is, will you do it? Using social media. Social media is huge, right? It's the way to, of us expressing our ideas, right? Using followers, using how much do we promote our ideas on, on Facebook or Instagram when we throw, or like for example, Snapchat, I know the, the uh, UIC guys here are using geo filters for our convention. That's huge, right? So people, when, even if they're flipping through filters in the area, they'll see Delta Epsilon sign. They're like, hey, what is that? Right? And they'll do some research. It's branding, it's marketing, it's building your name, right? And that's very important. Word of mouth marketing, however, does work best. Your friends will speak the best of you, and that's how you're gonna get things, right? When you wanna buy a product, you usually call someone who has that product, right? And say, hey, what's your experience with it, right? And that's what we have to do more with our fraternity, right? We, do we actually speak to our friends and our peers and our coworkers and say, hey, did you guys know that Delta Epsilon has an official partnership with the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation? This, you know, or our fraternity did this, or our fraternity did that. Because a lot of people associate this connotation, fraternity, with drinking and partying, right? That's kind of, it goes synonymous. In every movie you watch, and every kind of book you read, those are the two terms go, right? But they don't tell you of all the things that you can accomplish, right, with mouth word. Self-promotion, you have to promote your self worth. No one else will. If you're negative, if you're not confident in yourself, if you don't believe in yourself, right, you, you, no one else is gonna do it, right? If you don't believe in promoting your own worth and your own value, who else is gonna do it for you? You think someone would promote Facebook or Twitter if the company didn't believe in its own vision and its own message? That wouldn't happen, right? And so many people judge themselves or criticize themselves for, for no reason at all, right? Self-promote yourself, say what you're doing, say what you're doing in school, where you're doing community service, what's going on in your life, right? That's how we get people inspired to getting things done. The end here. I am done. Do we have questions, comments, discussion? I kind of made this short. Um, I know that NC wanted to move on and we have to get going, but I didn't want to leave five to ten minutes of questions or discussions so we can be more interactive and not just me here lecture you guys. So, questions? Any questions? Yes. Uh, what kind of uh, inspiration do you have? Uh, what kind of Inspiration. So I have a lot. I don't have like one role model. I would personally say I look at different different things and what people accomplish, right? So if to me, like I look at LeBron James as a as an example. He went from high school into the NBA at the age of eighteen, right? Signed a hundred million dollar deal with Nike. Now he's at a billion dollars, and he's done all this before the age of thirty. Mark Zuckerberg created Facebook at the age of twenty four, right? Snapchat was created in a dorm room by three people who were twenty two years old, finishing up Stanford. Right? And my, what, how I look at it is, if those people could do it, we're all humans, right? Why can't we? What sets us apart, right? Why, what did they do? And that's why I love reading books. And I love reading about people and their drive. And most people tell you, from what I've read is, is they didn't follow the status quo, right? They didn't do what they were told to do. They did something that their passion lied in, right? They found something that truly interests them. And that's how the very successful people, whether it's Bill Gates with Microsoft, or whether it's, you know, Anybody else who's made a fortune, they follow their passions, and that's what I kind of look to, and I don't let age be a, be a restriction. Yes? 
Absolutely. Um, so I founded, like I said, in uh, 2010, spring, I was a founder. I, I had um, a very unique experience. I was vice president of the fraternity for, for a year. Um, I've been PC, I've been a PD, I've had a little of a huge family. Um, we call ourselves the WRS guys, I'm sure. That, that goes nationwide. But um, I've been at NC, um, I've been really involved with the fraternity, right? I was the PD for the founding guys here at, um, at Kappa. And, um, yeah, I think I've been multiple, this is my third or fourth convention now. And um, I love the fraternity, I love what the fraternity stands for. Um, I love what it brings to the table. It's not your everyday fraternity, right? It's what I truly like about it is that no one knows what it is, right? So even though we're 18 years, if you come up to a random person, it happened yesterday, I was telling people, Dave and Busters, they're like, oh, what fraternity are you guys here from? I said, Delta Epsilon Psi. She said, I never heard of it, right? That actually inspires me because we still have the opportunity to make this fraternity us, the young guys here, whatever we want it to be, right? When you take over a company, like Ford, for example, it's very hard to change the culture because it's been there for 100 years already, right? But when someone doesn't know something yet, it's awesome how we want to brand ourselves, you know? And that's why I made. Do we want to be the, the potheads, the alcoholics, the, you know, the, the party animals? Or do we want to be the people that know they make a difference in our communities, throw signature service events, fundraise money for JDRF? What is it that we want to do? Right? And that's what I think the most that our fraternity can do now because we're still so young. I think that's key. I'd like yeah. to give a shout out to Fox for sponsoring uh Tier 3 Bowl for the last few years at Alpha Beta. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Anybody else? Questions, concerns, comments? Yes, Churchill. Kevin, yeah, so uh, since we do have a few deals in here, kind of just let them know how they can get involved within the fraternity with locally uh, and further on national level, regional level. How they can get involved? Well, I think that's... Um, kind of go from where, where you started at Alpha Beta as founder and your progression along. Right. I got really involved um, with my local chapter, and from there, I decided to reach out and try to get an NC. I think the best way to do that is building strong relationships with the people above you, your mentors, right? Talk to your regional directors, right? It's what well, I was telling Churchill that actually, yesterday we were talking about this and I was talking to Neil. Um, people don't think it's a two-way street, right? People will be like, oh, well, this person never called me, right? Well, it takes two people to, to tango, right? But you never called that person either, right? So if you truly are passionate, you are interested, reach out to NC, find your regional director. Maybe you want to become, you know, you want to be involved in philanthropy. I know there's a bunch of committees that um, they have, which these guys can tell you more about, but I know there's a marketing philanthropy uh, committee and a philanthropy committee. Get involved there, start off there. Find out what those committees do on a national level. That, that you find passion in that, find out how you can take it to the next level. It's like I said earlier in the presentation, it's finding what you're passionate about and taking it to the next level. Whether you want to do that or not, once again, that's up to you. Anybody else before I concede the floor? All right, guys, thank you so much. And like I said, feel free to uh, reach out to me in whichever way you guys want to. All right, everyone, uh, give it up for Kevin. That was informative. Kind of told you guys a little about where he started, what he feels about the frat, and personally, so put it together one last time for Kevin. Oh.